Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stop on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. I'm Amy Joy Thompson, and I will be your guide on this journey toward understanding viral hepatitis. This is the fifth video in my playlist covering microbiology, and we are going to review the five main types of viral hepatitis, their vaccines, serum testing, clinical presentation, and treatment. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. The most common cause of hepatitis is viral hepatitis, but there are many other disease processes, such as fatty liver disease, alcohol, medications, hereditary diseases, and autoimmune diseases that can cause hepatitis. We will cover those topics in other videos. This video will focus on viral hepatitis, but it should also be noted that other viruses, such as EBV, CMV, and herpes, can cause liver inflammation as well. In viral hepatitis, damage to the liver results from cytotoxic CD8 T cells, killing hepatocytes that are infected with the virus. There are five types of viral hepatitis, hepatitis A through hepatitis E. We will focus today on hepatitis A, B, and C, since D, D and E don't show up in exam questions very often. Although the five viruses listed above have similar sounding names and can have similar clinical presentations, they are actually a diverse group of unrelated viruses. Each virus belongs to its own family and order. However, the classification system is very low yield, so we're not going to focus on it here. I will cover each virus's genome and their envelope. Here is the table from a herpes video that we will be referencing as we go through the rest of the virus videos. Hepatitis B is a double-stranded DNA virus. While hepatitis A, C, D, and E are all single-stranded RNA viruses. Hepatitis B, C, and D are enveloped, while hepatitis A and E are naked. An easy way to remember this is that the letters A and E are actually in the word naked. Hepatitis B, C, and D are transmitted through IV drug use, blood transfusions, before 1985 when screening was implemented, and needle sticks. Hepatitis B can also be transmitted sexually or from mother to fetus via vertical transmission. Hepatitis A and E are transmitted by the fecal oral route in tainted food or water. Undercooked seafood is another source for hepatitis A and hepatitis E. Prevention for these viruses includes improved sanitation, clean water, better hand hygiene, and heating food properly. Since these viruses are more common in developing countries, the question stem often mentions recent travel. Another mnemonic to remember the association between travel and hepatitis A and E is that the word airline also contains the letters A and E. Hepatitis Delta cannot infect a host on its own because it does not have all of the necessary machinery for infection and replication. Therefore, hepatitis D only infects patients who also have hepatitis B. The presence of hepatitis D increases the severity of hepatitis B. Just remember that D is dependent on hepatitis B. Viral hepatitis can have a wide variety of clinical presentations, and given the large amount of overlap between the different viruses, you cannot make the diagnosis based on symptoms alone. Viral hepatitis is often only subclinical or asymptomatic, but these individuals can still spread the disease to others. When symptomatic, it is primarily characterized by anorexia, nausea and vomiting, jaundice or yellowing of the skin, dark urine, malaise, and fever. There may also be hepatomegaly or enlargement of the liver with associated right upper quadrant pain. These symptoms often don't arise until multiple weeks after infection. Hepatitis B is associated with polyarteritis nodosa, or PAN, which we will discuss in further detail in the vasculitis section. In most cases of viral hepatitis, acute inflammation is self-limited and quickly resolves without causing permanent damage. However, certain types of hepatitis can progress from acute to chronic hepatitis, with inflammation long lasting longer than six months. Chronic hepatitis can be symptomatic or subclinical, referred to as a chronic carrier. Long-term complications from chronic infection include fibrosis, scarring, cirrhosis, and an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. Hepatitis B, C, and D can progress to chronic hepatitis. 
About 10% of hepatitis B cases progress to chronic hepatitis, while about 90% of hepatitis C progresses to chronic hepatitis. Just remember C for chronic. Hepatitis A and E can't progress to chronic hepatitis. Think A for acute only. Fulminant hepatitis is a type of acute liver failure that is rare, less than 1%, among hepatitis A, B, and C. However, when present, it can lead to death within weeks if a transplant is not received expediently. We will discuss liver failure in much more detail in the GI section. Hepatitis has elevated liver enzymes, also known as liver function tests or transaminases. These enzymes are leaked into the blood as hepatocytes are damaged. Both alanine aminotransferase, ALT or SGPT, and aspartate aminotransferase, which is AST or SGOT, are elevated. But remember that ALT is elevated more. This is the opposite of alcoholic liver damage, which usually has AST greater than ALT. ALT is usually greater than 1,000 in acute hepatitis, while levels can vary during chronic hepatitis. LFTs do not necessarily correlate with the severity of the disease. Hepatitis will also have elevated bilirubin, both conjugated and unconjugated, as bile duct cells are injured as well. In severe cases of chronic hepatitis, a liver biopsy may be performed to rule out other diagnoses or to determine the severity of the liver damage. If an active infection is present, you may see lymphocytic infiltrates, hepatic swelling, necrosis or fibrosis, or acidophilic bodies called councilman bodies, which signify apoptosis. Here you can see some of the swollen degeneration on the left and then an apoptotic councilman body on the right. The serology for hepatitis B is very high yield and it's also quite complicated, so I will attempt to break it down piece by piece. You may need to rewatch this video a few times for the message to actually sink in. You can also find all of the pictures I use in these slides on the website. Go to the hepatitis page on stomponstep1.com if you want to download these graphs and tables. Hepatitis B surface antigen, or HBSAG, is the protein in the outer lipid envelope of hepatitis B. It is represented in the picture in orange. You can test for this in the patient's serum. This signifies an active infection, as it is present during both chronic and in early acute infections. However, things get a little trickier than that, because hepatitis B vaccine is mostly made up of surface antigen. Therefore, a recently vaccinated person can be positive for HBSAG, the hepatitis B surface antigen. After a number of weeks, vaccinated individuals, or those who had resolution of an acute infection, form antibodies against the surface antigen that are called hepatitis B surface antibody, aka anti-HBS or HBSAB. This antibody is IgM early on, and then later converts to IgG. You can go back and watch my video on antibodies to get a refresher on seroconversion. Since this antibody helps the immune system identify and fight the virus, it confers immunity to hepatitis B. You can test the serum for the presence of the antibody. When positive, it lets you know that the patient was previously vaccinated or had an acute infection that has since resolved. The antibody is not present during an active chronic infection. The window period is a short period during acute infection or vaccination when there is no surface antigen or surface antibody found on serum testing. Both are present, but they are bound together and therefore are not detectable by the test. Essentially, the ratio of antigen to the antibody is just right so that everything is bound up. During this period, one could accidentally misdiagnose a patient as not having hepatitis B. However, the window period isn't completely empty of all markers. The E antigen and core antibody may be present during the window period. We will discuss those markers in a minute. So here's the graph for vaccination. I'll cover the acute infection graph shortly, but it is essentially the same thing you see here with an extra test added in. So you start here on the far left and give a patient the vaccine. The amount of surface antigen in the blood spikes over a short period of time. At its peak, the immune system starts to make antibodies against the surface antigen. 
as the amount of antibody increases and starts to bind the antigen, the amount of antigen decreases. Eventually, you reach the window period here in green. This period, all of the antigen is bound to antibody, so neither is detectable in the serum. Then, the amount of antibody continues to increase until there is an excess of antibody that is not bound to antigen. This antibody continues to increase before leveling out and remaining at this level for many years. You can see the antibody here in yellow. The core antigen is a part of the capsid. You can see it here in blue. This is inside of the envelope, and therefore it is not detectable in the serum and we don't have a blood test for it. However, we can test for the antibodies directed against the core antigen, called the hepatitis B core antibody, anti-HBC or HBCAB. It is IgM initially before seroconverting into IgG. The antibody can be found during and after the resolution of an acute infection. However, its presence does not confer immunity as the antibody can also be found during a chronic infection too. Anti-HBC can be found during the window period, which helps you differentiate an acute infection in the window period from somebody without an infection. However, you won't always be given information about anti-HBC on the exam, which makes identifying the window period a bit more difficult. Here is the graph representing an acute infection. On the far left, we would have the time when the person gets infected with the virus. The surface antigen increases, just like after receiving a vaccination, and then it decreases to undetectable levels during the window period. Then, surface antigen antibody becomes detectable as the acute infection resolves and the body develops immunity. The new part of this graph is the core antibody seen in blue. It is detectable relatively early on and then continues to increase until the infection is resolved. And here is the graph for a chronic infection. The infection starts just like an acute infection, but it never resolves and no surface antibody against the surface antigen is ever formed. Therefore, the level of surface antigen never decreases and it continues to be high for years. The core antibody is also present. Here is that information in table format. I don't think it would be helpful for me to just read this to you, so just pause the video so you can look at it or go to our website to download the picture. There's just one more thing to add to our understanding of serology. Hepatitis B E antigen is another protein that can be tested in the patient's serum. I did not include it in the previous pictures because it would have further complicated an already very difficult concept. Hepatitis B E antigen is a protein involved with viral replication. All you need to know is that if HBE antigen is present or positive, it signifies that there is an infection, either acute or chronic, that the virus is actively replicating, and it is highly infectious. This means that the virus is more likely to spread, especially from a mother to her fetus. It doesn't show up as often on the exam, but you can also test for HBV viral DNA, also known as the viral load, using PCR. A positive result or a high quantitative reading can be interpreted as similar to a positive HBE antigen result. It means that the virus is actively replicating and is more contagious. A positive HBE antigen or viral load signifies that treatment is necessary for chronic hepatitis B. Also, make sure you don't confuse the hepatitis E antigen with hepatitis E, as it is a marker for hepatitis B. Similarly, the core antigen is not for hepatitis C. For antigen and antibody testing, I have just discussed HBV so far, since it is by far the highest yield and the most complicated. However, similar tests can be used for other viruses and the same principles apply. For example, the presence of anti-hepatitis A virus, IgG antibody, signifies a previously vaccinated person or indicates recovery from a previous acute infection. Anti-HAV IgM signifies an active but resolving acute infection. Hep A and E only require supportive treatment as these are more self-limited. Acute hepatitis due to hepatitis B and C usually do not require specific treatment. Chronic cases of hepatitis B and C do sometimes require treatment. 
Treatment is usually indicated in chronic hepatitis if there is a high viral load or positive E antigen. Interferon is the first line treatment option for hepatitis B, while the selection of medications for hepatitis C treatment is based on a number of factors, including specific genotype present. Hepatitis C pharmacology is beyond the scope of step one. We will discuss antivirals more in a later video. Transplant may be indicated in severe cases of chronic infection or fulminant hepatitis. There is a vaccine for hepatitis A and Hep B, but none for the other types of hepatitis. The Hep A vaccine is available in inactive or live attenuated versions. It is often given to travelers before going to an endemic area. Hep B vaccine is a recombinant vaccine that is made using yeast cells to create hepatitis B surface antigen. It is routinely given in the U.S. to one-day-old newborns. Additional doses will follow. To review the types of vaccine, you can go back and watch my video on vaccines in the Inflammation and Immunology video series. I'd like to thank Ismail McKella from Hallandale Beach for his generous donation which helped fund this video. If you would like to help support this project, you can go to stomponstep1.com slash donate or click on the screen box here if you are watching this video on a computer. The next video in the series is going to cover the influenza virus, genetic drift, and genetic shift. To be taken directly to that video, you can click on the black box here. Thank you so much for watching, and good luck with the rest of your studying.